everyone. Welcome to the Worship Artistry Podcast. My name is Jason Houtsma, and with me is... Christina Kislanka. Hello, Christina. Hello. How are you? Oh, I need to come up with a better word than fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. It's better than fantastic. That's good news. Yeah, that's it's great. News. It's really good. Oh, that's good. Yes. Do you like my new haircut? It's fresh. You just got it. I just got it. Like two minutes ago. Do you know why I got it? <laughs> why? Because I'm going to the Innovators Conference, Ayo. and I gotta look spiffy. In Chicago, I gotta look real in spiffy. Person. I know. This is very exciting because we we <laughs> the Innovators Conference has been an idea for like three years now. Yeah. Something like that. We were supposed to meet in person, and uh, it's finally here. Finally. It's finally here. We're going to to Chicago. Chicago. Which is uh. How a nice South African lady one time said, my daughter lives in Chicago. And I was like, she's like, it's That's a big, incredible. she's like, it's a big city in the U.S. Do you know it? And I was like, Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. got I it, love that. got it. But uh, it, you're having a little debut moment. Yeah. Well, I, I'm very excited. So I'm doing a Ted style talk. Yes. I don't know who Ted is, but I'm doing something like that. It's like 15 sure or it's an acronym, but we can 15 or 20 minutes. And uh, so I've been practicing that a lot, Incredible. really trying to work on my, you know, I was a communication major. I took speech, like I, I gave so public speaking. So this is something speaking. that you should be able to do. In theory, yes. Uh, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. And then, uh, so I've got that. I'm very excited about that. We're going to be talking about why music matters. Amazing. Which uh, I think for worship musicians is an often actually overlooked thing. Mm -hmm. We tend to focus on all the other stuff, we focus on the spiritual, we focus on organization, we try to mm -hmm. focus on practice, but we don't focus on like, what does it really feel like to play great music? Mm. And uh, and so we're gonna talk about that. I also have workshops on, um, on, uh, on arranging mm -hmm. songs for your team. So whatever, you know, so whatever like your band arrangement, it's like, okay, this is how we approach every song. So cool. And then we also have another one that's arranging song for solo acoustic guitar, because I don't know if you know, I don't even know if you know, I don't know if I know. But on, uh, I worship in all my guitar lessons, uh -huh. there's always a solo acoustic oh, chapter. Oh, I did know that. Okay. I did know that. But there's always a solo acoustic mm -hmm. chapter where I break down like, okay, if I was just playing this by myself, how do I keep it interesting? You know, everyone's like, oh, four mm -hmm. chords, you know, and it's like, well, let's bring in melodies Spice and rhythms and dynamics and all these things. Yeah. So we're going to talk about all that too, which, which I'm really excited and for. And this podcast is actually going to go live probably the day that you're doing all of this. Probably, probably, the, when, probably day after. Day after. It's Monday day and after. Tuesday. Got it. Yes. Day after. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm excited. I get, I get to knock most of the things out on Monday so then I can just chill and get ready for the cornhole tournament. Ooh. Which We're going to win. Oh yeah. I already told Brian, I, I already <laughs> told Ryan Dahl, like, just like start, put my name on the trophy now. Right now. <laughs> Amazing. It's going to be a fun time. Yeah, it's, I'm really excited. And uh, I'm also really excited for our guest today. Yes. Who is it? His name is Austin Ryan. Uh, he is with a group called Worship Catalyst. And what they do is, we'll talk all about it, but what mm -hmm. they essentially do is uh, mentor and train up church plants and like smaller churches and just kind of just these things that there's so many things when you're planting a church or when you're leading worship that they should just be automatic and they're just not. Mm -hmm. And, and Ryan you know, and Austin, I always want to call, he's got two first names, Austin, throws right. me off every time. <laughs> Ryan Austin. Yes. But Austin <laughs> uh, and, his, and his team, they really like coach folks mm -hmm. up. They really work on the relationship between pastor and worship pastor and just kind of building all this. And it's, it's amazing what they do. And he just brings so much good wisdom and knowledge. And uh, I was taking notes. So without further ado, Austin Ryan from Worship Catalyst. Austin, welcome to the podcast. Oh man, Jason, great to be with you. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on here, man. Well, why don't we get started? Why don't you just tell people a little bit about what Worship Catalyst is? Oh, uh, you betcha, man. So, you know, Worship Catalyst, we are a ministry that's really designed and built to help churches connect people to Jesus better in worship. And um we do that through training and discipling worship leaders and their teams and, and, and all of that. You know, we started, uh, we started this 15 years ago, really out of a need we didn't know existed because we were in a church that had the bells and whistles, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we had been serving there for almost a decade and uh, felt like maybe God was having us start a church and, uh, my wife, Cammie, and me, we uh, just started to kind of 
looked down that path. And as I started to call church planners uh, out in the West, we were living in Texas at the time, but we started calling church planners out in Arizona and some other places. I realized that what I was finding is that the majority of the church planters I was talking to didn't have worship leaders. And if they did, they didn't really know how to develop them or to get the teams built or to integrate it into the service. And so anyway, we just kind of felt like uh, there was a, a way for us to take the things that we had learned and done and, and uh, you know, not just help a church, but to go help a whole city of churches. And so, so we, we left there and, uh, uh, you know, start, started raising support uh, because, you know, you, you, charging church plants is a fool's game because uh, there's <laughs> not really, not really money. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we still still raise support 15 years later so that we can we can serve churches but the um but yeah i moved out to arizona and started serving there and then uh some other cities around the country and now we have 20 different uh, locations that we have teams of people that serve um serve churches in their areas that is wild man so so how does like, what does that look like? So like when you guys went from like, okay, we're trying to do this small thing and then you're, and you're growing and you're kind of building, you know, how did you, like, how does that look when you're, if you're trying to help a city, like you're saying, like, we want to try and help churches in a city. Like, what is, what is that approach? Yeah, we call, we call those hubs. And so what they, what they do, they've got five different components or really four different components. And there's one that we've kind of built nationally, but um, one of the components is that we have a leader called a connector. And so what that leader does is one thing they do is try to connect worship leader to worship leader and just make sure that there's a community and a connection. You know, only about 15 percent, one five, 15 percent of churches in America have full time worship leaders. Eighty five percent of churches are either non paid or part time or whatever. And so there are full there are networks of church uh, worship leaders in, in cities and things that, uh, where they have lunches or whatever in some places, but the majority of the worship leaders just don't have access to stuff like that because they have normal jobs or they're full-time students or whatever it is. And so, um, so one of the things they do is just try to find out where the worship leaders are that are the ones that are, nobody knows who they are mm -hmm. and make sure that those people feel connected and feel like there's community around them. And there's places to go for resources and help and training and things like that. Another uh, the second thing they try to do is some workshops and, and all that uh, as needed. Like we have one of those. I live in Jacksonville, Florida now. We lived in Arizona, then Las Vegas for a long time. And now we live in uh, Jacksonville Metro. So we're doing a workshop uh, just here in a couple of weeks. We had a couple of luncheons with worship leaders and there were uh, a lot of guys showed up and we just started asking what's going well, what's not going well. And everybody was like, well, we need to build our teams. We need to grow our teams. And yeah. so we're doing a we're doing a workshop on, you know, ways to ways to look at growing your team and some possibilities of things that you can try. So they do some of the things like that. And then the third thing is really the bread and butter, uh, which is walking with churches. So like mm -hmm. one on one, getting to know uh, what the needs, like assessing the needs the, as it relates to worship ministry of a particular church. Um, and then um, building a plan that we could do to help them and then deploying people uh, that they know from around the city to help them. And so that could be anything from super practical stuff, like showing up at band practice to help those churches get better, you know, mm -hmm. that way it can be, for, you know, recognizing what are some technology needs that they might have, or they could help them technologically get where they need to get. Sometimes it's most of the time it's developing a, a point worship leader to get better at, you know, at leading worship. Um, sometimes it's, a leadership structure that we have. And so we have a lot of tools that we've developed over the years that we just kind of deploy into those situations uh, so that they can get healthier. And then the fourth thing they do is they try to build some sort of resource network where if somebody needs to borrow a drummer for a week or a bass player for a week or something like that, that, you know, we've got some names on a list that they could be helpful. That's yeah, that's, that's fantastic. What, what kind of value do you think that a worship leader, like a, an equipped worship leader brings to a church plant or even just like, like smaller churches, you know, you're saying like 85% yeah. of churches don't have a full-time worship pastor. And it's like, I'm not sure. Do you think, do you think that speaks to how we value a worship leader or do you think, do you think it's more purely financial? Like what, what, what kind of value does somebody who really can focus on that and, and be the lead in that? What kind of value does that bring to it? 
to churches as, as you've seen it? Uh, man, that is a really, uh, that is a lot of layers to that question, <laughs> Jason. I think, we got time. We got time. I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I think that when the, I don't necessarily think that it's that the part-time thing speaks to the value placed. Mm -hmm. Because I think that most pastors, with the exception of a few who probably think that music is just a preliminary to the main event, which is this amazing sermon, you know, or whatever. <laughs> uh, but I hope that we are, you know, we are steering away from that concept. Uh, I think it is financial for the most point, because every church has got to make a decision. How are we going to spend the limited resources that we have, you know? Mm -hmm. And if the vision for the for the music ministry of the church is four songs on Sunday, okay, and that's kind of the end of it. Well, I mean, I, I know there's worship leaders that listen to this, and you're going to hate this, but the reality is, picking four songs, rehearsing four songs, playing four songs is not a full time job. Okay? That is a fact. <laughs> as a as a you part as a part time worship leader as a as a as worship a, as a, a part time worship leader I'm like yep <laughs> exactly so that's not a full time job so then it starts to be like what is what is what is it that a worship pastor really needs to do you know mm -hmm. and so if it's not some sort of traditional you know worship and youth or worship and you know, administration or chief of staff or whatever the various roles are in a church, I think at the very least it is team builder. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, it is pastor of your team. You know, it is relationship builder. Um, I think it is developer of other worship leaders so that you're not the only one on, you know, the only one on rotation. Uh, you know, uh, there, there's just a lot of, there's a lot that goes into that. And, and I think that the, I think the value that a worship pastor that really knows how to not only like grab the congregation and drag them to Jesus, we say the role of a worship leader <laughs> is to go to God and take other people with them. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's like, it's pretty simple on paper right? until you start to uh, actually dig into what that means. But if they're going to do that, I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that. I mean, there's knowing the congregation, building relationships around the community. There's understanding the crowd, not only in the room, but also the crowd that might come into the room. There's, you know, knowing your neighbors and inviting them to church and being a follower of Jesus that people see Christ through and, you know, and, 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 and. And so, um, you know, I think in a typical scenario where somebody just like their life is devoted to something else and they come in and all the vision they've been cast for is don't be terrible on Sunday mornings, you know, <laughs> just don't stink, don't stink up the place. Then, you know, it, that's what you get. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do is to cast vision for worship leaders that you can actually build a team of people that can make an eternal difference in the lives of the people that show up on a weekly basis. Yeah. That is, that's, well, it's, it's that role, that, that piece that you talk about, you know, we, th we, th sometimes we interchange the words worship leader and worship pastor. And to me, there's mm -hmm. such a different thing, right? Like a pastor is somebody who is supporting the team around them and like trying to build people up and trying to grow and all those extra pieces. Like, but all that stuff really does take a lot of time though, right? Like it doesn't just happen. Cause I can, I have been for a long time, you know, it's like I, I run worship artistry and then I also have my, my church and like. I play a, a worship pastoral role, but it's a small church and I'm realizing just how much time goes into like in order for us to build teams out. Cause we're kind of having to start from scratch, like post COVID it's just like people moved, people had kids, people yeah, like it was sure. just so much change. And it, I, you know, I sat down with like basically a whole entire new team of people and realizing, okay, this isn't, this isn't going to be just picking a few songs and getting ready for Sunday. This is going to be like coaching a lot of people up, you know? So it's, it, it is like a, it is like a time crunch. So when you're working with worship pastors that are in that, in that time crunch, or, you know, only have a few hours that they can give to this thing, what are some of the key things that you're just like, this is a non-negotiable, like first thing I come in, you're a worship pastor, you're, you're a worship pastor here at this church plant. Like what's the first conversation that you have with them? Yeah. Um, that, that goes one of two ways. 
the the first most important thing is to figure out what the is to figure out how to instill the values because we would what you're asking we would call we would call those valuables like these non-negotiables mm-hmm. okay so and the reason that's important is because if you do have this goal we're going to go to god we're going to take other people with us like that's our thing we're going to make sure that people are not left out that they're connecting with jesus and we're not we're not just pointers of people to jesus we're actually leading them the the thing is if, if that's the goal then we've got to stay on the path towards the goal mm-hmm. okay so so what values do is they keep you they're like guardrails that keep you in the middle of the lane going going there, keep in the middle of the road. And so um, those values that we teach, there's seven of them that are, I, I think, completely non-negotiable when it comes to worship ministries. Mm-hmm. One of them is excellence, and that is defined as doing the best you can with what you have. That is not mm-hmm. defined as perfection. It's not defined as lights and you know colors of lights and <laughs> moving of lights and sound system. <laughs> Yeah, it's doing the best you can with the resources, human money, all that kind of stuff that you have. The second one is creativity. I mean, Genesis 1-1, we are introduced. God says to us, I am creator at the very beginning of the whole Bible. And then 26 verses later, he says, I made you in my image. And that means that we are creative, no matter whether we think we are or not. And so we're not really living into one of the very first things God told us that we would be if we're not being creative in everything that we do. And so whether we're instrumentalists or singers or worship planners or pastors or anybody or Christians, just followers of Jesus in our work and school, students, all of it, creativity has to come out of us or else we're like not even sort of expressing who Jesus is through us. Mm. So. Uh, creativity, unity isn't a value that we have to, you know, have together, man. I tell you, the Bible says super clearly that if we don't have unity, we don't have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We don't have worship. We don't have evangelism. We don't have the blessing of God. I'm like, we have, we don't have church if we don't have unity. You know, the reason I think that many, 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 many churches never experience the fullness of what God had in store for them is because we can't get the relationships right. We can't get the biblical unity right. And so teams have got to have that. So teams have got to, have got to be excellent. We got to have creativity in our team and in our lives, and we have to have unity among us. And we have to. And the fourth one is um, authenticity, and that's authenticity vertically uh, with God. You know, like being real in our worship, and it's not just like words, but it means something, and our lives match it. And also horizontally with with one another, we're not you know hiding anything. Like we're just being real with one another on teams. It's so important because it's hard to express creativity and all those other things if we don't have an authentic relationship with one another. Um, humility uh, is obviously like probably the one everybody talks about the most, right? Hmm. Pride. There's some, I don't know, there's a lot of reasons for this, but church bands are kind of an incubator of pride, you know? <laughs> it's like a perfect, the perfect soil <laughs> for pride to grow. And so humility has got to be a value that we just uh, die for, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, be like Jesus in Philippians chapter two, you know, did not consider equality with God something to be held on to, but instead took the form of a human man and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And the scripture says there, be humble like that, you know yeah. what I mean? <clears throat> Which is an impossible goal, but maybe something we can at least always live towards. Uh, evangelism is like the, is the, is the sixth value there. And man, that's, uh, you know, honestly, Jesus left us on earth in Acts 1-8. He left us on earth to really just win the world to Christ mm-hmm. or to at least be witnesses of his work on earth. And so if we start to think that worship is all about the music or the experience on Sunday or, you know, or about the, cool stuff that we can do or the new songs we can sing or write or the, you know, all the trappings of it, man, then we have missed, like, if that's where we stop, we have missed what Jesus called us to. Mm -hmm. And that is that people would come to know Christ. So if our worship ministry does not both personally and corporately express an evangelistic outward focused mission, then I think it's, it's lost its, uh, ability to get to the goal of connecting people 
with Jesus in a, in a, in a real way. And then finally, uh, the last one is party, you know, <laughs> non-negotiable man. we got to have fun. You know, if we're not going to, if we're not going to have fun at leading worship together, man, then we, we've, uh, you know what, you're not going to have your team around very long. If you're a leader, yeah. you know, and you're, you've got people that don't enjoy being there, then trust me, they won't be there very long. There's a lot of things they can do other than be in your band. Yeah. That's in a, man, those are, <laughs> It's just like you could just write a you know a whole thesis on on that. That is so incredible. I, I'm curious, like you know, you've worked with all these churches. I'm curious, you know, you're, you're saying that uh, that worship teams can be an incubator of pride. I think that's a really interesting way to say that, and I think it's true to a lot of our experiences. At the same time, it 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 never seems to line up for me in the sense that it's like okay, if 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 you're so if if this is like like if you if if you're struggling with humility as a worship team, just go watch like a real band that goes and like tours and like plays the same <clears throat> songs all the time. And like, does this or like, or compare yourself to, I don't know, like the one that we're worshiping. Like, it's really hard to be, to be proud in that. Why do you think that, do you think that there's like something with musicians that just kind of like, is it in music culture? Is it kind of in that, uh, creative, creative personality? Um, what do you think like feeds into that? I think there's several different things that feed into that. The biggest and most comprehensive one is that Satan wants to tear us down hmm. as worship leaders. And so he speaks to us in two different ways. As we lead worship, he either says to us, you're the best leader in the world. You're the best guitar player. You're the best singer. Look at all these people. That guy's raising his hands because you're such an awesome leader. Or he says, you shouldn't even be on stage. You're the biggest loser. You're the worst singer. You look stupid. Your jeans are, you know, not the right size or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you're fat. You're, you know, <laughs> all those very, you know, you sound flat, whatever it is. And mm -hmm. it's like all these various things that the enemy says. So I think that's primary is just like, we're working against one who wants to steal, kill and destroy mm -hmm. everything good because he does not want to see people worship Jesus. That's for sure. Um, but in addition to that, you know, I think it's like the mom syndrome a little bit because mom always thinks you're the best, mm -hmm. right? Mom just always brags on you and just says, and when you're a little kid, you believe it, you know, but then you get older and you go, man, mom was lying that whole time. Mom said I was the <laughs> best student and mom said I was the best singer and <laughs> Mom said I was the best everything. Well, she wasn't. She was just being encouraging. She wasn't being mm -hmm. truthful. You know? And the worst thing that we can do is listen to the people in our congregations talk about how amazing we are. Mm -hmm. Like, we need to just like be, hey, I appreciate that you had a really good experience with Jesus. But, in, but we just need to not internalize all those positive comments that we get from people. Because <laughs> they're, they're, either that person is just being kind and Christian, which is great. Or they have no context for what they're like. They've never heard anybody else. And so you're the only thing that they've ever heard. Um, but then I think a third part of that incubator, Jason, um, has to do with, well, I, I, I would call it the American Idol syndrome. I don't mm -hmm. know. that. I don't even know if American Idol, do they still do that show? I don't guess I've, they do. I have, I have no idea. Yeah. The I Voice or one of the other million shows that... <laughs> Ameri American Idol, back when it was a big deal, was unique about this, okay? Because, um, do you? I don't know if you ever saw it, but they used to do these parts where, like, these really bad singers would come in, mm -hmm. and they would um, sing, and they were terrible, and so it was basically a time for everybody to make fun of them, you know? Yep. yep. But those people standing there believed that they were good singers. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that some people just don't have the, they don't have the ability to know whether they're good or not. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got people encouraging you because they're Christians and you don't really have the ability to know whether you're good or not, and you put all that together, then you start to think you're actually something. Because those people that come on to show, to like an American Idol and audition and the, the reason they're there is because people lied to them all that time, you know? Mm -hmm. I know that's a weird thing to say, but I mean, I remember as a kid, there'd be like in the church I grew up in, there'd be some terrible singers that would sing. And I knew that as a kid, you know, I'm like nine years old going, man, that person's terrible. 
But the problem is people would go up to him after it was over and just tell him how great they were. So it gets to propagate this unrealistic, you know, thing. So anyway, I think mostly it's Satan, but I think also we kind of build into this. <laughs> Well, that's, so how do you, so how, that's a really great, uh, a really great point. How do you then balance that? Because they're, 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 I think in the, in the church, we do something very different than, you know, in a, in a lot of other scenarios where, you know, it's different than like auditioning for a band or auditioning for a quiet that's going to do a performance, right? We kind of like are pulling from the people in our community. We, you know, there's, there's different levels of where all those people are at. Right. And music is still kind of this. You know, I was, I was talking with my worship team this week about how it's like, okay, like everyone's got a great heart here. We're all really excited about that. But there is a baseline of ability. It's not like being on the setup team. Like anybody can take a chair and move the chair over to here. Not everybody is at a place where they can, where they can lead people playing music. Like there's this baseline of skill that needs to be there, you know, like, so, so how do you balance that though with encouraging those people who aren't quite there yet to help them get there? And at the same time, you know, like without doing that, without, li with, without lying, and, you know, and without kind of creating a false sense of, 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 ex of experience or ability. Do you have audition? Do you have an audition process for your band at your church, Jason? Yeah, it's, I mean, we're a small church. We're kind of the main thing that I do is I usually get together with somebody one on one and just say, like, hey, come to my house, let's play for a while. And then we have That's a conversation out. Yeah. yeah. Casual and then after audition. that, yes. And then after yeah. that, we say, well, yeah, well, you know, like, Hey, if you kind of work on these things, I could see you really being a great fit or, or it's like, what are you doing this week? <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think however that, however that audition funnel is set up, you know, and mm -hmm. depending on how elaborate it is or simple it is like yours, I think that's got to be set up. And, and and the thing is, I think there needs to be probably to save you from looking like a bad guy, a little more structure than a little less structure. Mm -hmm. Because the worship leader can be in the worst position in the world. They're supposed to be like pastoring and leading, you know, the church. And yet they're the ones telling the people they're not good enough, right? Which is right. a horrible position to be in. So um, I think that most of that can be taken care of in the initial question that you had by having an audition process that has enough structure in it to where the the process or the structure helps um, helps with the honesty and the truth right, and the right. love. Okay. And so with the clarity up front, hey, if you're a guitar player, you need to be able to play in these keys and you need to be able to um, you know, play the every chord in those keys or whatever. And know how to use a capo. If you're a singer, if you're a female singer, you need to be able to sing alto or harmonies mm -hmm. or whatever. And drums, you got to be able to play with a click track or whatever the things are that you do, right? Mm -hmm. So that there's at least that expectation of, oh, well, I probably don't match up. That's on the front end before yep. they even ever make it into a room. They know what the expectations are. And then when they, and then I think, I think the follow up to all that, man, is just like, making sure people know here are the op here are the, here's the way this could turn out it could turn out where you play with us or sing with us it could turn out where you don't and if you don't we're going to give you a growth plan um so that maybe in the future there's an opportunity and then i think that that growth plan has got to be robust and really helpful mm -hmm. um, for any, for every single person uh and uh, in fact i would say because we do every single person gives a growth plan no matter what if you just got off tour with you know you know, playing with some band or whatever, still, we're going to, we're going to give you a growth plan, uh, to try to make sure that you're going to fit in with the team and all that kind of stuff. So that is such a, it's, it's funny, like part of the, the, the reason for worship artistry, like one of the main things is I was looking at it going, I used to be at a church where I used to be at a much larger church. I helped plant this other church. So it's, it's always funny when I talk about like experience, cause well, I'm in this little thing and it's like, no, I've done, I've done, I've done the gamut. And like, I was at this large church and I remember it just being so hard because we didn't have any growth plan. There was no way to go. It was kind of like, well, I guess you should go take lessons and um, maybe you can lead the children's church once you've done that for a while, you know, like, which right. doesn't really lead to anybody really growing. Usually that leads to like, well, I'm not good enough. And then that's the voice that gets heard. Right. And so being able to have like 
that's like what what do you put in a what do you put in a growth plan yeah i mean obviously it's 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 you know detailed for every for different people but like what are some of the things that you that you want to create what what does a robust growth plan look like right well yeah exactly i mean it's super tailor-made for that person you know for somebody that's a little farther along it may be um you know, give them some artists to go listen to mm-hmm. and have them try to copy those artists as much as possible. Um, because it could be that they come from a little bit more formal background. And so you're like, Hey, that, that vibrato is probably not going to, not going to work, you know? Yeah. So let's try to end that out. So here's some people to go copy. Um, it could be, uh, a lot of times in growth plans we have helped, we have had some of our team members actually, be willing to work with the people that are potentials for the future. Mm -hmm. And so, Hey, your growth plan is to spend six weeks or six lessons with our bass player, this guy who's willing to do that for free for you. Um, um, we have some, uh, uh, some training videos that we sometimes send people through, you know, Hey, go through the, every video we have on lead guitar. And then when you master all those videos, come back to us and let's sit down again and see what happens. Um, uh, vocally is a little bit more challenging, but we we have had as a growth plan before too. just come to practice for the next six months mm-hmm. when you can and sing with our singers, you know, especially if it's people that really struggle with harmonies. And so we'll, and it'll be really specific, like, uh, you know, uh, go, go to, um, and I love worship artistry for that too. It's like, just go and listen to all the alto parts and memorize those. But if it's going somewhere live, record that part and go home and practice it 15 yeah. times, you know, and stuff like that. So like, we're trying to, we're trying not to say, you know, Hey, go find a teacher. We're trying to give them some stuff. that's not going to cost them a thousand dollars that they can right. actually, uh, you know, get better at what they do. Right. Well, and then they enjoy it more, right? Like that there's nothing, there's nothing like growing to actually like inspire you. Right. It's, it's, yeah. it's, you know, I've, uh, I've slowly been, just been, as I've been doing more, like I've been playing guitar forever. Right. But I just like, I've been learning drums and it's like, man, Oh, I just learned this beat. Like there's this like little dopamine hit that you get when you get it. Right. And then that inspires you to go to the next thing. And then that inspires you to go to the next thing. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, I think especially the older we get, like just kind of continuing to be a learner is mm. such a, it's just such a life giving thing to, to be a part of. And so it's awesome that you kind of, you know, build people through that and are like, Hey, let's, let's grow into this thing. Um, the, the harder, the harder part is when there's people that are never going to like, they want to be singers, but they're not, and they're never going to be, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that's the part where as, one of our roles, I think, as pastors is to help guide people into what Jesus has, um, you know, uniquely crafted them to do. Because every single person has a role in the kingdom of God. It's just not everybody's supposed to be a singer, you mm-hmm. know. And so I think sometimes people in their in their spiritual journey just have a hard time hearing hearing what that is, you know. And so they feel useless. But there's a thousand ways that they can use their talents for God, you know. I mean, it's, it's limitless. And so what we want to do as leaders is not to just rely on somebody coming to me and saying, Hey, I feel like God's called me to sing on the praise team. Mm -hmm. No, it's more like, Hey, so here's what I see. Here's how I see Jesus already working in you. And here, (laughs) I just want to call that out, you you know, and I want to call that out in you and and empower you. And and like, I want to lead you towards a path. That's not music because you've got, maybe you could sing someday, but the reality is you're already awesome at something else. And so let's do that. You know, and that may be, that's like the most life-giving thing you can do to somebody is to help them understand their calling, you know? That's, that's powerful. I want to touch on, uh, on the mentorship that you do, because you kind of do that. You do this, this kind of ongoing mentorship that happens between worship pastors and pastors. Um, tell, tell me about, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So we've been mentoring people through this worship leaders through this process called worship leader essentials for a really long time. And we've had like, I don't know how many, well over a thousand worship leaders go through this through the years. But the, what we realized one day is that a lot of times we'd be sitting there almost every time we would be, we'd be working with a worship leader somewhere in this like several month process. And they would kind of lean back in their chair at some point and be like, I don't think I can apply that at my church. 
And you're like, okay, why not? Well, I don't know if my pastor would go for that. And I'm like, okay. Um, what makes you say that? Well, you know, he just doesn't, you know, I don't know. He just didn't, blah, blah, blah. And then finally we get to, but have you talked about it? Well, no, we don't really talk about stuff like that. Okay, what do you talk about? And what we figured out was that most pastors and worship leaders spend most of their time talking about Sunday, mm -hmm. you know, because they're part-time and they don't have hours and hours to dig through the intricacies of the, like, philosophies and theologies and all that kind of stuff. And so what we what we decided to do is to is to start our five month mentoring process, continue that in its deal, but before it starts to spend two days with that worship leader and, and his or her pastor. And what we do in groups of several churches, and uh, we do this online or we could do it in person, but um, we spend like 10 hours or so 10 or 11 hours over a two-day period, helping worship leaders and pastors have conversations about mission, vision, values, and strategies for their church as they relate to worship ministry. We also give them some really clear next steps of things that they can do, um, not only relationally and covenantally, but also just like super practically on worship service development and team building and all that kind of stuff. And when they walk away from that two-day period, which is about 60% teaching and 40% guided discussion between mm -hmm. those two leaders, um, when they walk away, they're on the same page, man. They are. They, they, they understand, and they're walking together arm in arm on the mission of worship ministry and the values of worship ministry and the, the potential that they want to go for, the goals that they have, the, um, the strategies they're going to use and all that kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> so that when we jump into the mentoring the next week with the worship leader it's like they have got a full tank of gas and they're ready to get going and moving so it's really great yeah it's yeah it's awesome it's so it is so interesting that like the, how you point out like how often the only conversations end up being about sunday right like we all say like it's not about the production but yeah it is <laughs> you know? how do you spend your time how do you spend your money? That's what's most important. Right, right, exactly. And so, uh, yeah, man, I think I think what you're doing is such a it's such a valuable, even just perspective, to have with with worship ministry. I think it's like there are certain things that if we understand them, they they drive so much. When you have those values, you know those seven things that you listed off. Like, if you can have that be the thing that's driving what you're doing then all the practical pieces and everything, it all just kind of naturally fits into that. And I think, you know, you guys doing it for, you know, for church plants and, and, uh, you know, in small churches and just looking at cities, it's just a, such a, an awesome ministry. And I'm so grateful that you're, that you're taking the time to do it. And I love the name worship catalyst. That's just like, Sweet. A, that's, I love, <laughs> I, that's like one of my, like, so that's one of my words. I love the word catalyst. So catalyst. yes, you got it's, me with uh... that. And igniting and igniting, right. exploding. It's good. It's awesome. Well, where can, uh, where can people go to learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, it's great, man. Worshipcatalyst.com is the place to go for everything. And it's, uh, it's a way to sign up for worship leader essentials for you and your, uh, for the worship leader and pastor of your church. Um, those are, those are, there's always some ready to go online and various dates. You can just pick, pick one and, and go for it. Uh, there's a fee for that. We've also got some other online courses uh, that are on there. There's a, the values that I talked about, you said that could be a thesis. It's actually a yeah. book um, <laughs> called Radical, Radical Worship Solution. And uh, there's been a lot of, there's been hundreds of churches that have taken that book and it's built in such a way that it's got questions at the end mm -hmm. of every chapter so that the teams can go through it together. And it really is the best way that we could figure out to help worship leaders get those values instilled into their lives and into their team so that they could leave with them, um, you know, with purpose. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, go check it out. And, uh, Ryan or Austin, thank you so much for, for jumping on with us today. I think it's like, there's so much to chew on. Like, I'm like, I'm going to go listen to this again later today. And cool, man. Chew on it hey, thank you, Jason. I appreciate it, man. It's been a good time chatting. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Man, I really love his heart. Mm -hmm. I think it's 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 so like humble and caring for the church. And I think you know, as somebody who has 
uh, helped plant a church mm-hmm. and gone through that process, that can be really lonely. It can be really hard. And so having, having people around you that kind of come along and sometimes just go like, hey, just make sure you do these things and kind of simplify things a little bit on like the really powerful things, yeah. I think is really helpful. Yeah. How does, um, how do you mentor your worship team? Or like, what does that look like at your church? Because I know we've talked about it on the podcast before of how you just started kind of building it back up, having yeah. a bigger team. So what does that look like in your context? It's, you know, it's, it's definitely like a learning process for mm-hmm. me, for sure. I, like, I don't have a, like, here are these, you know, here's my book about how I mentor my, my step team. By step. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think like for, for me, what I've really been trying to do is kind of reiterate like what we're doing here, mm-hmm. why we're here, and really tried to pull out from people why they care about it, mm-hmm. you know? And, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, like questions like, you know, like why, why do you choose to serve in, on the worship team? Why, mm-hmm. why did you choose worship instead of the setup team or instead of greeting, you know? And, yeah. and really hearing people's hearts and then trying to meet them in that place. Because I think that like a good worship ministry inspires people to be excited about it. Yeah. I think we get, we get sometimes really caught up on the whole, like, you know, serve, you're here to serve. Like, like we got to yeah. like push musicians down because like, Hey, don't, you're not a rock star. Like stay down here. And it's like, no, nobody wants to be a rock star, but we all want to have fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't want to feel like I'm a slave, <laughs> you know? And so I think kind of looking for those places of passion and then pulling those things out and then finding a way like this last week was super fun. So we had, uh, we had, we had our practice on Monday And we arranged all our songs, felt really good about them. Sunday rolled around. We had rehearsal again just before, you know. And a lot of times you do that and you're like, do we just have to relearn everything? And it was not the case. (laughs) It was not the case because we actually recorded parts and we were like, okay, here's these. Like we have just on my phone. And we were like, all right, here's what everybody's doing. So everybody had it. So we plowed through it Mm -hmm. and we're like, this is awesome. And then, uh, and, and then we had a bunch of time and I was like, well, hey, I've been working on this new song. Let's play around with it. Mm-hmm. And so we got to arrange that together. That's really cool. And it was the coolest part about it was Megan, who is our, our keyboardist and she was singing with me and there's kind of almost like a call and response in the mm-hmm. song. She's just like, I'm getting like chills. Like I'm getting like jittery. Like I'm loving this so much. That's so cool. And it's like, that's the thing that lights people up. Yeah. It's like, okay, you love yeah. arranging this. You love coming up with your own parts. You love having this this space. Yeah. And so I think the more that we can just coach people to come out of their shell and do that to me, that's how I'm trying to mentor my people. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, there's all, there's way more than that, but that's the yeah. thing I'm excited about right at this moment. At this very moment. That's know. great. That's awesome. I love doing that. We, I try to do that with my team in terms of like, they're really good. Like we've played together for so long that we don't really need to like practice or learn. Like they mm-hmm. just come prepared. Well, I hope that they come prepared, but they end up just like getting through it and it sounds great. Um, but then when like before service, uh, if we're just doing our like sound check and we're running through the songs, like I almost try to treat it as a like pre-worship worship mm-hmm. set. Oh, that's great. Where, yeah. Like during, uh, even though we're just like running through the songs and everyone knows we're just running through the songs, I still w- will worship through them. And I mm-hmm. will like, instead of just like ending a song being like, okay, that's fine. Let's move on to the next one. Mm-hmm. Like actually letting them like, like play th- a little bit afterwards and like just having an instrumental, like we may not do that during the actual service. Like it'll depend just like where we go, but at least they have that opportunity just mm-hmm. to like play around and yeah. like be creative. Um, so I, I try to be intentional with that. So how, how, how do you, how, like, how do you as the leader do that? Like, how do you create that space? Yeah. I mean, I just, well, to go through the song the way that they know, like mm-hmm. just the basic structure. And then as we're like ending the song, like I will just point out or like, I'll just look at them and just be like, Hey, just keep playing. Like, just like, let's keep playing. And I will, if I'm not on keys, which sometimes I lead from keys, sometimes um, I don't. And so when I don't lead on keys, then I will just vocally try to like lead into something. So I'll just like sing something spontaneously or something. Um, or just repeat a line that they can just like flow on. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I'm on keys, then I will just like musically lead, lead into just like, I just won't stop playing basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they like might stop playing and they're like, Oh, she's not stopping. <laughs> okay. So we're just going to keep playing too. <laughs> this is good practice for that anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I love doing that. And some, like there's some special moments before that too. Like it, and like I said, it doesn't always translate exactly to what happens during the service, 
but I think it's special. Like, I think it helps like prepare your heart for like what will happen during the, during the service. For sure. I, yeah. You know, it's funny. I found, so uh, we, we do a, a program called Godly Play for the, for the kids. Mm-hmm. And they have this thing, they call it the prayer of three deep breaths. Mm-hmm. And you just take a deep breath and you say in the name of the father, mm-hmm. another deep breath in the name of the son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And we do that as a congregation a lot of times like okay we're gonna do the prayer of three deep breaths and then everybody does it and i've started doing that at the start of worship that's really cool because it is i mean it's just kind of yeah it just kind of like makes you more present yeah makes you more there and i think like actually worshiping together does mm-hmm. the same thing right when you're not like what's my cue what do i have to do yeah. and yeah. you get to just be like i'm here let's like, just play around we yeah. always start i was in a band and went, that's how we would start everything like all right First, pra- first part of practice, we're all just going to play. Let's just start going mm-hmm. and just see what happens. And then you lock yes. in and then you go. And I think yes. a lot of times we like just totally cut that because we're like transitions. Uh, make sure, okay, I'm yeah. going to say this here. I'm going to do this here. And it's like, those are the things that actually yeah. keep us I've excited actually, about it. I've never, uh, my team knows this. I've never practiced transitions. <laughs> like my team, there would be certain musicians. They're like, well, what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to go to the next? And I was like, I don't know. You just finish. We'll finish it when we finish it and then we'll go on. Like, <laughs> do you, do, okay. Do you, are you okay with silence or are you the kind of like, like, I think there's kind of this whole, like yes. always keep a pad there. So there's no silence. I'm much more of a, like it. And that is the end of that song. I, yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't like silence. I think it's awkward. Um, I think it's inevitable sometimes mm-hmm. like for there to be like a split second of silence, but my keys player knows that's like, they will start or like they'll finish and then they'll just like straight away, like go and hold like the next chord while the rest of the team kind of transitions. Yeah. So there's like something cause we don't use tracks and we don't use like, um, synths, like yeah. just playing. So we do it manually. Like someone actually has to play it, but they, yeah, we, we try to be kind of seamless into the next one. Yeah. I just don't like the like abrupt stop and go on. And I'm just a big fan too of like, usually I'll have, my full set in the same key too, mm-hmm. just so it's a lot easier to to flow from one to the other. And gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I, it's funny. I remember that's how I kind of grew up, mm-hmm. and then I went to this church where they just would stop the song, mm-hmm. and I and I got really comfortable with it. And so I'll actually use that for silence. Like, you'd be like, let's all just take a moment now. That's good. You know, and those kind I of think things. As long as you lead people through it, and right. it not feeling like. That's like stop and play. Like right. <laughs> totally. exactly. Hold on and a one and a two. Yeah. And a <laughs> right. Well, if you want to uh, learn some songs and you want to expand your catalog and you want to work on transitions and go between them, or you're okay with silence, either one works at Worship Artistry. You can go sign up for a free trial, worshipartistry.com, where you can get detailed tutorials for guitar, drums, bass, keyboard, and vocals for three-part harmony. And uh, like I said, you can try it for free. And uh, I don't know, learn 600 songs and, and... Just 600. Just 600. That's all you need. Like... You, there's got to be five in there that work for you. Have you, know? you ever wondered how many songs you actually know? Ooh, that's a good question. I've thought about this often. I don't know them. Like, I don't know that. Like, I, like I've taught every one of those songs. Yeah. And if you play it, it'll all come back to me. Yeah. I'm finding that even now, like, getting ready for the Innovators Conference. Uh, it's funny because I, I teach all these songs and I've done all this. But, like, we've talked about, like, my own band situation is very different. Yeah. So I'm fully playing, like with a click track Mm -hmm. and I'm playing rhythm guitar and I'm like, I cannot mess this up. I can't be the guy like the music matters. It's so awesome. And then be like, "Uh Oh, are you going to use worship art to prepare? Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. But it's what I'm saying is it's amazing how much it comes back to me. I'm like, I know exactly what's going to happen. I know that hit is there. I know like, it's just, it's all in there somewhere. And uh, I just have to re refresh and I'm, I'm excited about it. This is like a, I mean, we're using planning center, we're using Amazing. all kinds, like, I'm like... All the tools. I feel like I'm, I am doing big church, big boy church right now. <laughs> big boy church. I'm in the big boy band. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Try not to let everyone down. <laughs> well, and on that note, we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>